With tensions rising, protests on the streets, one presidential election annulled and another just weeks away, I'll speak to Kenya's opposition presidential candidate and the country's former prime minister, Raila Odinga. I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. More than six years into the war in Syria and with Bashar al-Assad still firmly in power, is it time for the opposition to admit defeat? And was it a mistake for outside powers to have backed the Syrian rebels in the first place? That's our debate. But first, following protests and legal challenge from the defeated opposition candidate Raila Odinga, the Kenyan Supreme Court annulled a presidential election for the first time in the country's history. The decision was hailed by some as a victory for democracy and the rule of law. But Odinga says he won't participate in the re-election scheduled for next month until his demands for electoral reform are met. So, what's next for Kenya? This week's headliner from Nairobi, Raila Odinga. Raila Odinga, thank you for joining me on Upfront. The initial results of August presidential election saw you losing to incumbent president Uhuru Kenyatta by 54 to 44%. Uh, this week, the Supreme Court said it had annulled those elections because they were neither transparent nor verifiable. The court also ordered a re-election to be held next month. You must be delighted to have another opportunity to run for president yet again. Well, yes, the, what the court did was uh, the right thing uh, because as you know I know that I did not lose the elections I know that uh, I won the elections and that the result were just manipulated so th this is what we call an injustice and the court did the right thing after examining the evidence we placed before it and nullified those elections uh, former Ghanaian president John Mahama, who was the leader of one of the international observer missions in this election, said the Kenyan election system appeared, quote, credible, transparent, inclusive. Kenya has the potential to be the most inspiring democracy in Africa, he said at the time. He's not the only observer to praise your country's election. The U.S. State Department at the time welcomed the transparency, integrity and public confidence in the electoral process, impressed by Kenyans' commitment to ensuring their voices are heard through the ballot box. So you can understand why incumbent President Kenyatta doesn't agree with this Supreme Court ruling. The international observers are largely on the president's side, are they not? Well, we were very disappointed with the, the position taken by the international observers. It really brought to question the role of international observation of elections they did not wait to see, to witness the transmission of the results from the polling stations to the tallying centers at the constituency and also uh, to the, at the national tallying center where uh, everything went wrong. That was why we say that it was very unfortunate. But the other thing is uh, President John Mahama did not disclose that he had a conflict of interest. He's a friend of President Uhuru Kenyatta. If the international observers praise October's rerun, will you accept their verdict in October? I, I don't uh, expect them to praise. I want them to just be objective. Mm. Uh, if, if I win, fine. Even if I lose fairly, they, then they should say so. So just to be clear, you are running for president again next month? Yes, I will be running and uh, subject to certain conditions being met. Uh, we have written to the Electoral Commission in which we have given them a um, reducible minimum which they need to meet for us to participate in the elections next month. Uh, William Ruto, the current vice president of your country and one of your former coalition allies at one time, he asked on Twitter last week in reference to you, for how long will one man unable to win elections continue to blackmail 45 million Kenyans using threats of violence, chaos, bloodshed and anarchy? What do you say to him? Ruto basically uh, uh, suffers from um, am amnesia. Because in 2007, he was with me. He was in the, in the front line fighting against the rigging of the elections. And he is on record as saying very many things about what happened in 2017 and 2007. Mr. Ruto actually lives in denial 
because he himself has witnessed election rigging firsthand. Uh, a fair point. Uh, before the August elections, you asserted that the only way Kenyatta could win and stay in office was if he rigged the vote. Are you going to say that again if he wins this time in October? Because if so, doesn't that make this whole process pointless if you're never going to accept the result? I say that he, he could not win with the, except by, by rigging. And I have been uh, actually proved right. Uh, you see that he did not win this time round. He rigged the elections. And I, I know it from the kind of support that we have on the ground, that he cannot win a, a free and fair elections. I've got a bigger support base. There's no way that he can beat me in a, a proper, direct, a free and fair electoral Just process. to be clear, they didn't accuse Kenyatta of vote rigging. They said the Electoral Commission was not transparent enough. But just on Kenyatta, President Kenyatta has promised, has pledged to his supporters that even if you win the re-election, he will have you impeached within three months. Given his ruling coalition is not far from having the numbers in Parliament to do that, how worried are you that even if you win, you're not going to last very long? Your tenure will might be over before it even begins. First, you're saying... Uh, he did not rig, that is the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission was doing it on his behalf uh, and his behest. That's not what the Supreme Court said, though. That's all I'm saying. The Supreme Court didn't point the finger at Kenyatta, specifically. Yeah, of course, but he was the beneficiary of the rigging. So, uh, actually, you can infer uh, the, 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 the conclusion. The thing is that um, this this idea of impeachment is very hair-brained uh, because there are clear provisions for uh, impeachment of a president of the country. First, there must be a real crime committed by the president. And then it has to go first to the uh, National Assembly where they must get a two-thirds majority which they don't have. At least 28 people have died in the violence that followed the announcement of the election results. Uh, 28 people have died. Now, of course, everyone in your country remembers the election you lost in 2007, the violence that ensued then. I think over 1,000 people died at the time. More than half a million people were displa displaced uh, a decade ago. Are you worried that if the October election doesn't go your way, there will be even more violence? Will you be calling for protests again if you lose again in October and you believe vote rigging happened? No, you see, what we are trying to say is that uh, our democracy in, in Africa must come of age. The era of election rigging must come to an end. It must be fixed. We cannot just be glossing over it, that you have a situation where the incumbents hold elections every five years or so as a ritual. We, they must win at all costs, because this basically le lead to Apathy. With respect, Rilo Odinga, you're not answering my question. If you lose the election in October again, will you call for protests that may lead to violence one more time? If I lose elections fairly, I will accept and um, uh, tell my, my, my supporters we lost fairly. That's how it is. So we are Democrats. We are not uh, people who want to see violence uh, uh, on the streets. You're, but you're uh, saying to me, Raila Odinga, that if you lose fair and square, you'll accept the result and you won't protest. The implication being that if you believe vote rigging happened again, which I suspect you will say if you lose, you will call for protests and you will tolerate violence. You will be OK with the violence, to make a point. All I'm asking is, what message are you giving to Kenyans to try and avoid violence in October? What we are trying to tell Kenyans is that they uh, must be prepared that if they don't turn up in numbers and we lose fairly, we will accept the outcome of those resu the, the, the results. But if there is a, a, a rigging of elections, the people are entitled to protest. As you know, our constitution provides for peaceful demonstrations, uh, picketing, strikes, and so on. You've been the main opposition candidate for four presidential elections in a row. If you lose the rerun next month, is that it for you? Will you put aside your presidential ambitions and let somebody else run in your place next time? Someone maybe younger, different surname? I, I, I don't 
have to, it doesn't have to be me um, at, at all. I mean, uh, th this time uh, my colleagues are the ones who settled on me as a candidate. So, but we have we are a movement, and there are so many other people who are capable of, of running. But if we don't fix this issue of, of, of rigging, well, it doesn't matter who you, you, you choose and how, however popular that fellow is, still there will be rigging. So you need to see that the elephant in the room is this manipulation of electoral results. And this is what must be fixed for us to have a proper democratic society. This is what we are talking about and we are saying that African democracy should not be judged by different standards lower than they are, for example, in Europe or in the United States. Raila Odinga, thank you for joining me on Upfront. After trying to topple Bashar al-Assad for six long years, the Syrian opposition is not just losing the war, but also losing support on the international stage. The U.S. has announced it's no longer focused on getting rid of Assad, and the U.N. special envoy to Syria has said if the opposition was planning to win the war, quote, facts are proving that is not the case. So how did it all go wrong? And in hindsight, was it a mistake for outside powers to have thrown their weight behind the armed opposition to Assad? Joining me to discuss this from London, veteran Middle East correspondent for The Independent, Patrick Coburn, who's reported on the war since its onset and is the author of the new book, Age of Jihad, and from New York, Mohammed Ala Ghanem, a policy advisor to the Syrian American Council and former professor at the University of Damascus who's been involved in the Syrian uprising from the very beginning. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Mohammed, let me start with you. Even by the end of the Obama administration, it was pretty clear that the U.S. had given up on trying to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. Under Trump, that's now basically the official U.S. position. So, Mohammed, Assad gets to stay. He's won, hasn't he? No, he has not. Um, for sure, the Assad regime, its Iranian backers, its Russian backers, uh, and a cacophony of voices in the West are eager to declare Assad a victor. Um, but, um, you know, really... If you, if, what, what is the Assad regime right now? The Assad regime is not even the shadow of its former self. Assad is not winning. Iran is winning. Iran um, is getting its corridor to the Met 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 Mediterranean. Russia is winning. Uh, the Assad regime in the process lost legitimacy, lost independence. Assad cannot travel around uh, the country. And um, on the ground, the Russians do the fighting. Hezbollah does the fighting. Iraqi militias do the fighting. And everyone knows that Assad troops are little more than uh, entertainment. Let me bring in Pat Patrick Coburn, you've been covering this war since the start in 2011. Is it your view that Assad has basically now won and it's over for the opposition, for the rebels? Yes, he clearly has won because he controls most of uh, the Syrian population, most of the populated areas. Uh, the Syrian army is uh, pretty strong. The, his main opponents, Islamic State, uh, are on the retreat. Um, and uh, he's got a superiority of forces that's not going to end. The only way the Western intervention would have overthrown Assad is if the firepower of the US Air Force and its allies had been directed against Assad and in favor of the uh, armed opposition, just as they've given support to the Syrian Kurds or they've given support to the Iraqi army in northern Iraq. This would have transformed okay. things. But anything less and the, is just simply prolong the war. So, Mohammed, was the war unnecessarily prolonged, as Patrick put it? I, I don't think so at all. Uh, neither do uh, millions of Syrians, hundreds, at least hundreds of thousands of Syrians. The mistake that the community of nations or the international community has actually made is, was not extending real support. The opposition got a lot of rhetorical support, but there was nothing concrete to back it up on the ground. It was more like wishful thinking. We think Assad is going to fall, uh, so we're going to say that Assad is going to fall, but there was no real support. The mistake that the community of nations committed uh, and paid dearly for was actually not supporting Syrians in their quest for dignity and good governance. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of people would say, well, hold on, you know, the CIA at one stage, I think one dollar of every $15 of CIA's budget was going towards Syria operations. The Saudi, gave, Saudi government gave lots of money. The Turks opened their borders to fighters from abroad. The Qataris spent as much as $3 billion on the rebels in the first years. Are you saying none of that support counted? It was all irrelevant? 
Um, the, the CIA program that you're talking about is something I'm very familiar, is, is an effort I was very familiar with, I've written about, and the program was a joke. The West was never interested in affording the Syrian opposition a military victory. They were not interested, American officials would tell you, they, they don't want Assad to actually be toppled militarily. They wanted Assad to, the, to come to the negotiating table, so they're trying to turn up the heat against Assad on the ground a little bit, but it was, it was very meager, it was very small, it was never meant to Billions make a dent. Of dollars? And that's that's why the, the Obama Saudis, administration the Qataris, had the actually Americans, trouble. Now, think about it. Yeah. You, you, okay, yeah. you, brought up the, you brought up the Saudis. Briefly, and then the I'll Qataris. bring in Patrick. Do, do we have, you brought up the Saudis and the Qataris. Do we have Saudi troops on the ground in Syria? No. Do we have Iranian troops? Yes. Do we have Saudi uh, militias like the Iraqi militias in Syria fighting on, the beha on behalf of the okay. Syrian opposition? Fair no. point. Let's do bring we in. have a power? Do we have the United States actually fighting like okay. the Russians are fighting on behalf of the regime? All strong Those points. Let's have Patrick respond. Support. Patrick. I think that... It's one of the problems is that the Syrian opposition has gone in for a lot of wishful thinking along the road, which hasn't enabled them to really see the situation on the ground. The problem is that the most effective armed opposition were uh, people supported, trained uh, by al-Qaeda in Iraq. They had the experience, they had the supply lines and uh, so forth. Uh, so they immediately began to take over. They became the heart of the armed opposition. Even when they split between uh, ISIS and uh, al-Nusra, it was these extreme elements that uh, were in charge. And that the, was the great sort of political weakness of the opposition, which I think they never admitted to themselves. OK, let me ask, Mohammed. I just want to ask you, earlier you said the, the Western CIA support for the rebels was a joke. A lot of American officials might say, well, a lot of the rebels they supported were a bit of a joke. They would point to the fact that they gave weaponry to American you know, American-backed rebels got weaponry, which was then handed over to groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda. In 2015, for example, Syrian rebels trained by the U.S. gave some of their U.S.-supplied weapons to the Nusra Front in exchange for safe passage through the country. That's undeniable. That happened, didn't it? That is actually not what CIA officials in charge of the program said. CIA, actually top CIA officials in charge of the program uh, the, the, the top general in charge, um, so to speak, in, in charge of the program, continued to uh, argue for the program to continue, even under Mr. Trump, even under... OK, but are you saying US that didn't president. happen? Are you then, saying American-backed rebels Trump, uh, never Trump, gave any equipment then, to al-Qaeda groups, right, regardless of whether the generals Trump, agree? Yeah, you're right. I mean, some, some of that happened, but think about it. Um, but not in any statistically significant way. Let me put that point to Patrick. Patrick, you said earlier that from the very beginning you thought that there was no real chance of the opposition winning a military victory against Assad. But what, were you, what, but what should Syrians have done who were opposed to Assad, who were being killed by Assad? Should they have just surrendered because they had no chance or they were told by people like yourself that they had no chance? No, this is, this is very difficult, you know. Yeah. This isn't, you know, this isn't... Many Syrians, most Syrians I know, uh, felt they were choosing between bad and worse. Um, and they did think that the alternative was al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda tipped... Uh, uh, linked organizations would take over if Assad fell. Uh, and that, of course, was a strength of Assad. Um, who is bad I and who is worse, in your analogy, then? Because Mohammed's saying the... Assad's much worse as the number one killer mm. of civilians. When you say bad and worse, in your view, Th that's who's bad what and who's facts worse? I think that most people in Damascus, you know, and, other, and elsewhere, really did think that, yeah, they would prefer to stick with Assad rather than have Islamic State take over. Um, the or al-Qaeda linked organizations. That was the weakness of the opposition, uh, that the way the armed opposition had been taken over by them. I'm not saying that there's much they could have done about it. You know, there's a genuine tragedy here uh, which has faced the Syrian people, that there isn't an obvious alternative thing that they could have done. I just want to be clear on Sorry, one point, yeah. Patrick, because, yes, you're right, a lot of people do worry about ISIS and see beheadings and al-Qaeda atrocities, but the statistics suggest, and most studies and reports suggest, that the number one killer of civilians in Syria has been Bashar al-Assad. He's done barrel bombs. He's done torture. He's used... His militias have used rape. I mean, the major human rights abuse in Syria have been carried out by the regime, not by the rebels. Would you accept that? Yeah, I'd say that's probably true, but you have to... If you look at 400,000 dead, you know, this is a genuine civil war, uh, both sides merciless, with almost a competition to commit atrocities 
on both sides, that is and both sides that terrified is of each other. Not true. Okay, both Mohammed. with hard car, core support. Assad is responsible for over 95 percent of civilian casualties in Syria. So, I mean, let's just, just please use some data. So it's not an opinion that we're trying to propagate, or it's not propaganda. 95 percent, over 95 percent of civilians have been killed by ISIS. So I don't know how you can, you know, see that data and then say I both sides are equally actually brutal and it's a civil war. So we have to accept 400,000 people killed. There's a half of the population has been displaced and it's been displaced not because actually not even because of ISIS. Uh, you know, ISIS has displaced a lot of people, but, but Muhammad, you have the mainly the Russian rights. Air Force, the Assad regime Air Force, and they're displacing people. That's why you have refugees in Europe. Okay. You have a, an international refugee okay. crisis. So let me ask That's you a why question you have ISIS inspiring the human rights attacks. Issue that you raise, Muhammad. Regardless of equality, you don't deny, do you, that Syrian rebel groups have been involved in human rights abuses, have worked with some awful groups, mm, Amnesty, I, Human Rights Watch. So, so here's my question. I, I think you do agree with that. You don't deny that. So here's my question. Is that one of the reasons your revolt failed? Because so many groups lost the confidence of areas they were controlling because they were carrying out beheadings and shootings and stonings? No, 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 that's not what people in Idlib would tell you. That's not what, it, what, what people in Aleppo, at least 400,000 in the city of Aleppo, who are ethnically well, cleansed and had you don't uh, speak for all the to leave, would yes. tell you. Here's what they would tell you. Here's what they would tell you. They would tell you, um, uh, first of all, violations, uh, infractions, etc., were committed by Syrian opposition. And that is something we, we totally condemn, and that's, uh, you know, something that uh, we, we always try to, to address. But again, what's the percentage? Um, people left because of barrel bombs, because the Russians used bunker buster bombs. Assad targeted hospitals, schools. So it's not just an issue of moral equivalency that I'm trying to make here. It's pragmatic. I'm trying to be pragmatic here. For but me if you're to being be pragmatic, I'm just wondering, Aleppo, would you concede at this stage, we started the discussion by talking about how the opposition's on the back for Assad as momentum. Isn't part of that the behavior of the rebels? People around the world looked at Syria and said, you know what, there's bad guys on both sides. Yes, one may be worse nope. than the other, but the problem is the rebels didn't exactly cover themselves in glory. That Did is you not, concede that? That is not what Syrians and Homs, again, think about the major I'm not asking centers, about okay, Syrians, so Mohammed. I'm, I'm asking about the international community, which decided not to kind of throw its weight behind one side. The Perhaps international community, the inaction, the inaction of the international community, and this conflict has been going on for six and a half years now, has definitely empowered extremists, because think about it. You have, again, tens of thousands of people in the Free Syrian Army. You starve them of, uh, of resources, and then you allow AQ to, uh, to act as they wish in the country and to recruit people. Patrick, weren't Syrians betrayed by the international community and pushed into the arms of these groups? Isn't that the problem? I think this has been one of the weaknesses of the opposition, is this uh, completely unrealistic view of what was happening inside Syria and how people were responding. You know, if I'm sitting in Damascus and I see uh, ISIS in Palmyra beheading uh, people in the uh, theater there, if I see them setting fire to, uh, with petrol to people who they've captured, you know, I'm very frightened. I'm very frightened they're going to do the same to me but and my Patrick, family. But Patrick, a lot of frightened, Patrick, determined. but um, Assad said, uses extremism so let's to present us with either me or extremism. So let me put so that point to Patrick. if you would like extremism to end, you have to end Assad. Let me put that point to Patrick. Patrick, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, that Assad yeah, has sure, always yeah, wanted you know, to portray uh, the opposition as extremist, as run by Al-Qaeda. Have journalists like yourself contributed to that narrative, helped him with that narrative? No, because, you know, every government in the Middle East, since I've been covering it, which is a long time, always tries to portray its opponents as extremists. You know, it's, it's a, a conspiracy theory and a very misleading one to think that ISIS, the Daesh, was somehow an invention of Assad. Uh, it wasn't. He took advantage of this. Militarily, it didn't do him much good. The existence of ISIS was politically uh, in the interests of Assad, unfortunately not militarily. Okay, let me ask you this. More than six years in, hundreds of thousands of dead. Do you both believe that there is still a diplomatic a solution to th that can bring this conflict to a proper end? Yes or no? Mohammed. War is a terrible thing, but in Syria, we need a war to end this war because the Chamberlain-like policy of appeasement of, of, uh, of the Assad regime in Syria over the past six and a half years has not worked. And we have a crisis now of epic proportions. So we need a war to end this war. Patrick? No, we, what, exactly what we don't want is more war, more Syrians killed, more refugees. Assad has won. I don't think that's great. I also think it would have been very bad if his opponents had won. 
a lot of things are still up in the air. But I think the idea of we should have more war to get rid of Assad, that I'm afraid the verdict is in. It, much better that we try and have some sort okay. of peace. Okay, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you both for joining me uh, on this episode of Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.